Okay, Daniel, did you want to do a, an introduction or do you want me to just start? Uh, I was actually going to do an introduction. Okay. Good evening and welcome to First Thursdays at the Marin County Law Library. We're pleased tonight to have representatives with us from the Matrix Parents Network and Resource Center. I'd like to take a moment and introduce our law librarian, Stephen Richards. Um, Stephen is instrumental in helping us make these programs happen, and we are so grateful to have him. Why First Thursdays? First Thursdays grew out of what we saw as a need through the law library to engage more of our community in the resources and organizations that are here to help them. We would like to believe that the law library is instrumental in this because many people come to us for legal information through the program that Stephen very kindly um, spearheads, Lawyers in the Library. It is through his efforts as law librarian that we normally put that program on twice a month. We engage legal volunteers who will give a free 20-minute consultation to anybody who comes to one of them. And one of the things that we've noticed throughout the five years the program has been in existence is many of the questions um, start with one topic and may evolve into questions about ancillary topics that impact them. We discovered that there is a great need for people to understand how to get to resources. Hence, we have organizations like Matrix come, and we hope by recording this that we make it available to people who might not normally be able to come and join us at 6 p.m. on a weeknight. If you look at our website following this, you will see that our law librarian will post a link there, and also go to YouTube and look up Marin County Law Library, and you will find a growing library of these interviews. I believe this is our 21st one that we've recorded. The program has actually been around since November of 2019. And we're very pleased tonight to have Margaret Johnston join us from uh, Matrix Parents Network and Resource Center. I would also like to give special recognition to someone who has been to so many of our programs. And tonight we hope to engage her um, as we talk about Matrix. And that would be Barbara Alexander. I am not going to give the entire history of how this organization began, but I'd like to draw to your attention that it began in 1983, and it was three parents who came together and began doing what is so remarkable in a community. And that is they identified a specific need in the community, and that is they were all raising children with special needs. This was a time when there was not a lot of organized information available. Three parents joined together and formed an organization which nearly 40 years later may have contact of some sort with up to 5,000 people a year. Before we began this program, I asked how many people were working with them, what was the size of the board, what kind of contacts they were having. It should be noted that every contact is not going to be an intensive one, but stop and think of the outreach in a community like Marin and how this has grown. These families faced issues at a time when very little was known about special needs education, about integrating children into schools and school programs. They commented earlier that they were dealing with federal law it's an interesting thing. If we were to look around any given room and ask, what's your experience been with federal law, we would hear a wide, wide array of experience. Tonight, we're lucky enough to have folks come to us with an ongoing program that deals with ongoing community needs. Margaret Johnston, Barbara, and all of the nice people that make Matrix what it is, we welcome you. And at this time, I'd like to turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Margaret. Thank you. So I'm from Matrix Parent Network, and um, Danielle gave us a very nice introduction. 
But I'd like to start out with our mission. And our mission is to empower families of children with special needs to successfully understand and access the systems that serve them. So here I need to make the distinction that we don't try to do the parent's job for them. We're not an advocate. We're not an, a lawyer. We don't get paid for our work. I mean, we get paid as employees, but not by the parents who are using our services. So we're not representing their point of view to anyone else. We're helping them do their job as parents. And, and what we want to do is to make them be very effective in advocating for their own child. And we want them to know their rights and responsibility, um, especially in the case that they might run into disagreements or other issues with school systems or other service agencies. So um, I should note that while we help parents interact with all sorts of systems, a whole lot of our work focuses on helping parents understand and participate in the special education system. So, um, as was pointed out, we were founded in 1983, and um, one of our founding members is here. Uh, three, three Marin mothers who sat down and um, tried to figure out how to best get services for their children. Their efforts uh, evolved into a nonprofit organization that now serves the four North Bay counties of Marin, Napa, Solano, and Sonoma counties. And we have been successful over the years in obtaining a fair amount of grant support from the Federal Office of Environmental, um, excuse me, Federal Office of Educational, Special Educational Programs and through the State Department of Developmental, um, Department of De Developmental Services. So we have gotten federal and state funding to support our work we also get small foundation grants from time to time. And of course, we also raise funds like every other nonprofit does. So we have fundraising events and we ask people to make donations um, when they can. So what kinds of systems would we be talking about? Well, uh, there is the early start system, which serves children from zero to three. And that is carried out by the, re the regional centers in Marin County it would be the Golden Gate Regional Center. Um, there's the Lanterman Act, which sets up regional center services, lifelong services for people with certain significant disabilities. Um, there is a special education system that serves children between the ages of three and 22. Um, there's section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1983 that um, provides for accommodations to remove barriers. Uh, it's essentially the, the Americans with Disabilities Act type of um, accommodations to allow people to participate in any organization or activity funded with federal funds. Social security disability is important to many people. Um, many Families with children with disabilities get in-home supportive services. Um, the health insurance system, of course, is very important. Um, and the Department of Rehabilitation is one that serves um, students and adults that are looking for uh, regular paying employment and helping them uh, develop the training, the resources, and assistance they need in order to do so. Now that's just the main things that we deal with um, on a daily basis. There are other systems, but that gives you a sense of this array of things that parents of children with special needs might have to learn about and deal with. Um, and obviously dealing with all these moving parts can be very overwhelming. So while we're helping parents in this situation, um, we can pretty well generally empathize with the parents that we're working with because all of the employees at Matrix Parent Network are family members of people with disabilities. Um, in some cases, most of the cases that we are parents um, and that's our main qualification for the job that we have personal lived experience in having a family member with a disability we also get a lot of training on all these different laws and systems, but, but the main qualification coming in the door is that we are a family member of a person with a disability. 
in one case, it's a grandparent that's um, working for us and he's had a lot of experience with his granddaughter, but generally it's a parent. Um, so, so that's who we are. And one of the wonderful things for us about working at Matrix is it's almost like working in a support group because we all support one another. And we're always helping each other find things at, uh, and think about how to approach problems that we might have in, in helping our own kids. So it was already mentioned that uh, in Marin County, around 10 to 11% of public school students are identified as having a special need. Um, and that can range from having um, attention deficit disorder or dyslexia to having uh, cerebral palsy or uh, severe autism. So uh, sort of the whole array of types of disabilities. Um, and there are 13 different categories of disability that are recognized in special education law. Um, the system is governed through the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. And that act requires that uh, a system be set up that involves students and their parents in the development of what's called an individualized education program for every child that has an identified special need. And it's a very complex system and it involves first starting with um, an assessment done by a school psychologist and a special education teacher and other specialists as needed that, that assesses the child's strengths and needs as they affect their ability to get an education. Then it involves setting goals for developing academic, social skills, or adaptive skills. And it then sets up a, a system of monitoring how the child is making progress towards meeting those goals. It defines the services that the child needs, such as speech and language therapy, mental health services, adaptive physical education, specialized instruction, whatever service is necessary that the child can access their education and make progress. And then finally, setting up what's called the least restrictive environment. And that is the most inclusive environment possible in which that child can be successfully educated. Um, so that is a very complex system and parents need a lot of help navigating it. Um, we've been talking about how things have changed over the years. Well, schools have gotten pretty good at understanding their responsibilities. Um, one thing that hasn't changed is teachers uh, don't often have time to explain the system to parents. And so parents go into the school, into a meeting, and they don't know what's supposed to be happening. Um, and so our job is to help parents understand what's going on and how to go about participating in the system to make it work for their child. Some of the things we offer in uh, the process of doing this include training. Um, we have a helpline that we answer four days a week. We have a virtual support group um, and we have some in-person support groups. Um, we have a list of resources and referrals that we can refer parents to other services that they may need. Uh, we have a, a lot of publications that we have on our webpage. And we have what's called a parent-to-parent -parent program where we try to match a parent with another parent who has had more experience, but in the same type of issues and problems they might be facing, just to have um, a little more individual one-to-one uh, -one, uh, emotional and uh, moral support in their journey. Some of the trainings, I've just listed a, a few of the ones we give. We usually are giving trainings at least twice a month. Um, and a lot of them focus on transitions because this is a difficult time um, for parents. For example, when a child, a very young child is identified as having some kind of developmental delay, they're in one system that's run through the regional center, which is called Early Start. And the, the whole point of that program is to try to give services to very young children to try to help overcome the delay. Now, some delays are overcome through early services and others are lifelong and the early services help, but they're not going to eliminate uh, the special need. 
So when the child turns three, they may become eligible for special education preschool. And suddenly there's a different system the parents have to deal with. They were dealing with one agency, now they're dealing with the school. They were dealing with an agency that focused on helping the whole family uh, and helping the child in the context of the family to dealing with a school system that's focused entirely on what is going on in the classroom at school and uh, not particularly concerned with what's going on with the parents at home. So it, this is a type of transition that's difficult. And so we focus a lot of our trainings around different kinds of transition. Um, another transition that's very, very important is the transition from school to adulthood. So when a child either gets a diploma when they're about 18, or if they're not capable of getting a diploma, if they get a certificate of completion, they might stay in the school system until they're 22. Uh, but in either case, at one point, school's going to end. And then uh, the parents and the family have to work with other agencies in the community in order to obtain services for their child. All of the trainings we provide are now on Zoom, um, and most of our trainings are recorded and available through our, our website. Um, and we generally serve people in this four county North Bay area, but we do get people from all over who just happen upon our trainings. And uh, we even have a little, a, a little fan club in Georgia of <laughs> three or four mothers that tend to come to our trainings. Uh, because anybody can come to them at this point. Um, all of our trainings are free to parents. Um, we do ask professionals for a small fee of $25. Uh, and people do need to register because we do send uh, materials out as well as a Zoom link. So that's a little bit about our, our training schedule. In addition to the types of things I've listed here, we also do have a, a number of guest speakers come and talk about other issues, um, professionals in, in various fields. And one that uh, has been mentioned is we do have on our board, a lawyer who specializes in uh, setting up conservatorships for um, young adults who need that kind of support from their family. And, and so she gives a free uh, workshop on how to go about doing that. It generally does require legal services to actually get a conservatorship in place, but it certainly helps parents to understand in advance what are the issues and, and what are some of the things they're going to be required to do. So on our helpline, um, which we just answer calls as they come in, we advertise our phone number. Uh, we answer that Monday through Thursday, nine to two. And um, we, we have people who are bilingual as well as those who only speak English. So we do um, provide that service in English and Spanish. Um, and people call and they may have just a very simple question. Um, one of the common questions we get is, my kid's struggling in school, I don't know what to do, where do I start? And so we talk them through the process of asking the school to do an assessment of their child and what the timelines are, what they have to do to get it started, and then what's going to happen once that assessment's done. Um, we get that call all the time because people just don't necessarily know where to begin. Sometimes we call and someone has a, a big problem because things just aren't going well at all and they're not getting the kind of support they think they need. And so we might assign someone to work one-on-one -on -one with a particular family. And again, it, it depends. We have, we have all types of families. We don't put any kind of restrictions on who can call us. And sometimes we're getting fairly um, affluent lawyers and doctors calling us. And sometimes we're getting a single mom with three kids that have disabilities who's struggling mightily just to make ends meet. So we deal with all of these the folks in that cat, whatever the category, their social economic background is. And so some people just need more support because they are less able to provide the support through paying professionals or other means. Um, our 
goal in the helpline, as I think I've mentioned, is, is to help parents build their own advocacy skills. Uh, we firmly believe that knowledge is power, and we aim to give the parents the information and the tools they need to be effective. Um, so we, we do provide support in complex situations, but we're not case managers. Um, if, if a parent needs a referral to a mental health professional or to a lawyer, we refer them to those other systems because we, as I mentioned, we're parents. We're not psychologists. We're not lawyers. We know the system from our personal experience and from our training, but, but we can't provide uh, the kind of service that a therapist or a lawyer might provide. So, so there are situations where we just refer people to those other situations. But we always suggest that they also you know, work with us to learn what they need to learn about a system. Um, for example, we not infrequently have parents call and they're very upset and they want to hire a lawyer to deal with getting the IEP for their child. And sometimes that's necessary. But as we tell them, you're not going to have, want to have to take a lawyer to every IEP meeting for the next 12 years that your kid is in school. So it would really behoove you to learn the system, use the lawyer to get through this particular problem you're having right now, but then learn how to work yourself. You know, learn how you can be effective in having a relationship with a school and supporting what you think your child needs with evidence and making, making the effective arguments for the kind of services and supports they need. We also, try to help parents learn how to resolve agreements in a cooperative and collaborative way. And there are, are many services available to do that. Most of the school um, organizations have some kind of dispute resolution process that they can make use of. But we also let them know what their rights are so that if they feel the need to um, file a, a formal complaint or file for due process with the Office of Administrative Hearings or take that next step to resolve disagreements. You know, we help them know what those rights are and how to go about doing that if they can't resolve things in a, in a more collaborative way. We also have some support groups um, and we've had various support groups on and off at times during the years. I joined Matrix um, through a support group um, and that group, most of the kids sort of aged out. So the group is not active anymore. My kids are in their early twenties. So, um, you know, most of the parents in that group had their kids sort of grow up. And so they are all doing different things now, but we currently have um, a longstanding uh, Spanish speaking support group. Uh, it was originally, started to deal with um, the parents of kids with autism, but they actually uh, involve parents of children with other disabilities as well now. And it's led by a matrix bilingual parent advisor. And she's had the support group going for close to 15 years now. And uh, it's really become sort of a tight knit group that is also very welcoming to new members. We have uh, private Facebook support groups, both in Spanish and English, um, that does require people to, um, to join and be approved because we don't, we don't let uh, vendors or others join that list, it's just parents. And then we also have an early years and a transition to adulthood Spanish support group. And we're in the process of forming um, an English speaking transition to adulthood support group. So that's an important part of what we do. Um, we, we do like to provide uh, emotional support as well as information to the parents. One wonderful program we were able to carry out a couple of times, and we haven't had the funding to do it recently, is a mindfulness-based stress reduction program. Um, it was designed for, specifically for parents of children with special needs. It was developed by the Vanderbilt University and uh, we've used that successfully a couple of times, but it does require a special grant because it's not part of our, our baseline funding. We have a website, of course, everybody has a website these days, but there is a tremendous amount of information on that website. 
Um, we have a lot of our own publications. We have a newsletter that goes out electronically to about 5,000 people on a monthly basis. Um, we have links to national and other local resources, so other local organizations, but also the national network of parent centers um, around the country. And we all communicate with one another and get information from one another. And we refer parents who call us from someplace else other than uh, the North Bay area. We refer them to whatever parent center might be available to, to assist them. We have um, articles specific to different disabilities. We have a calendar of events and all, all of our trainings. Um, we have toolkits. Um, when I say a toolkit, we have sort of a systematic way that a parent can uh, lay out the issues surrounding their own child and their own, own child's educational pro program. It's sort of a way to analyze whether um, all of the information that's discovered through the assessment process is being addressed appropriately through the child's individualized education program. We try to provide up-to-date information as things have changed during the pandemic, all of the school closures, all of the ways schools have been opened, uh, different kinds of um, online learning that the children were uh, taking part in. Um, and we also provide just information when, when changes are made to, um, to state law or to practices that are going to affect parents. And again, um, we have the parent to parent program. So I think I've been through pretty much everything that's uh, on the slide, but we do answer questions. Um, we discuss the appropriate services, school placements. Uh, we don't recommend specific schools, but we do help parents find information about specific schools. Um, we try to help parents understand how to promote healthy lifestyles for their child and for themselves. Um, and we can suggest resources for early intervention, um, focus on collaboration. We try to help parents reduce school disciplinary problems and help them understand how behavior problems in children with disabilities is supposed to be handled at the school system through a positive behavior support system. Um, we put a lot of effort into trying to get parents to focus on what's going to happen, happen after high school and really to think about concentrating on their child's strengths rather than just focusing on weaknesses. question about sure. and I'm just about finished um, so I was just going to say um, this is just a continuation we're really trying to help parents build their communication and organization skills improve their family functioning build emotional support systems and focus on optimism and hope and and finally I just have to put this slide out up because it's necessary <laughs> which lists the types of funding we get from the state and federal government. And if that, with that, I'm finished with what I was going to say, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. May I ask a question about the Fragile Infant Program? Um, I noted that they um, suggested on the website that this might be something that is um, available for someone very quickly learning um, the identifying that their, their child has a disability. Is this a program that local health professionals are well aware of? Do they refer folks to you? Is this a referring to the early start system? Yes. Yeah, well, they okay. should be. Um, the regional centers, um, in this case, the Golden Gate Regional Center, provides the early start services. And we do refer parents to the um, early start system and they refer parents to us. So we have a good working relationship with them. Um, and all of us try to get information out to the pediatricians offices and Kaiser and, and other uh, to hospitals, um, every place that uh, when an infant or a young child is identified um, that they know where to go but it's always a struggle to get the information out and available to everybody that needs it. Um, 
and and we are trying to um, beef up our trainings in terms of what parents should be looking for in terms of developmental milestones. We have um, we have information on our webpage about that, but we're going to start providing more workshops in that general subject area because um, you know the first time a, a first time parent doesn't necessarily know whether their child's developing normally. They might sense something is amiss. And who are they going to talk to? They're going to talk to their doctor. Uh, and sometimes doctors are sort of, well, let's wait and see how things go. Um, and what we really want is for children to be assessed and be provided with services just as early as they can be. It's a pretty simple process. Uh, any parent who thinks their child may have a developmental delay of some kind can um, call or email the, the Golden Gate Regional Center and ask for an assessment. Um, and if, if parents need more help or handholding or information to do that, uh, they're welcome to call our helpline and we have somebody who will you know, give them more assistance in doing so. May I ask about the development of the family resource centers um, that came about? How far along after 1983 and your initial efforts did the family resource centers come into play? Oh, now you're asking me a historical question, and I don't know the answer to that. I'll have to look it up. Uh, so we have these various designations, the family resource centers are uh, uh, programs to help the very young children, zero to three age group. Um, and we also have these other designations as Family Empowerment Center and Parent Training and Information Center. Uh, we are very pleased that we have been the empowerment center for uh, Na Napa, Solano and Sonoma counties and we're not wrecking, there was no family uh, empowerment center in Marin. And we have just recently gotten a fairly sizable grant to serve that role in Marin as well. And that's going to allow us to do a little bit more outreach, especially to underserved communi communities. In terms of the development of the organization, um, what is not only remarkable is that this literally started over a kitchen table, but the breadth of the organization and what it's accomplished. Um, how long did this group work together and continue to grow? Um, clearly, the funding that you receive takes efforts in terms of, of developing grant writing skills as a group, and this might be something Barbara would like to comment on, tell us about, about your growth as, as you progressed from the very early stages to actually seeking sources of funding. Well, <clears throat> because as I, as I mentioned this, the original law, Public Law 94-142, uh, was created by the federal government to give money to various uh, region, uh, regions in the United States and uh, so that parents could be apprised of the process because the federal government knew that parents would have a difficult time because it was such a complex system. So that then created all these other uh, resource centers, we called ourselves then, um, <clears throat> around the country. So as they got up and running and we all sort of got to know each other, we would, um, you know, kind of toss around problems and what some potential solutions might be. And then of course we heard from parents, you know, what, what do parents um, really need? And so that's how these things grew little by little, bit by bit over the first, I would say maybe the first 15, 20 years. Um, 
you know, it took quite a while to develop all of this and all the other uh, parent training centers and resource centers were doing the same thing because we were building with knowledge from each other. And I think the fact that all of us involved in our center and certainly the other centers too, the fact that we all have children with uh, disabilities was quite a, uh, quite a bonding factor. And we could do a lot because we were united on that. You know, we wanted our children to be successful. We wanted them to learn. We wanted them to be able to get along with um, <clears throat> non just their non-disabled peers. We wanted them to be able to work once they got grown up because so many of our kids in uh, days gone by just ended up sitting alone at home or in a board and care doing nothing for the rest of their lives. And we, we knew we didn't want that. So um, yeah, so it all came out of the need little by little, bit by bit. And the uh, government was very, um, and I don't know how we got so lucky really uh, we were funded also by the, uh, the community foundation. And there, there was a guy there who I think really, really thought what we were doing was really important. And he managed to get us funding for many years, many years. So we had the federal money and then we had the community foundation uh, money. And that really gave us a lot of uh, legitimacy. And it also gave us enough money to get going on our on all of these projects. So um, yeah, I'm very, very pleased in the direction that that it's grown out over all these years. Um, my son now is 54. So he's definitely graduated out of this system. And uh, he's in another system now. <laughs> Um, which I'm still doing the same thing. So you do this all the rest of your life. So once you get, um, you know, get the knowledge under your, under your belt. So, and get the practice of advocating for your child's needs, you just carry that forward. So, uh, in fact, at seven o'clock, there's another, uh, Zoom meeting I'm going to tonight, and that is the family support group run by Community Mental Health for parents of, of uh, kids with um, or adults with um, severe mental illness. So my son developed into, from learning disabilities, developed into schizophrenia, <coughs> excuse me. And, um, and so I'm still, I'm still active in that end of things, but I'm so, as I said, I'm so pleased that Matrix is there. I just wish more people uh, knew about it. You know, but that's always the, you know, we would laugh and say, just when we get a certain teacher trained really well, she retired or, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so we'd have to start all over again. Um, but uh, yeah, so this is good. But uh, you know, there will be babies born with disabilities, um, you know, for the rest of our time here on Earth. So it's important that Matrix is there for those parents. I feel so. That's my it seems, from a legal standpoint, that we should touch on the intersectionality of everyone's life. The parent who quite literally ages themselves, the child who may age out of one system and into another. When we first came on, I mentioned that there might be some intersectionality of everything from disability and long-term care planning, but before even that, there might be issues of health care and Medicaid needs and insurance needs which might move into the issue of powers of attorneys um, guardianships and family law. And not the least of that, you know, um, we recently had a conversation about aging in our community, and I referenced the fact that Marin County is literally undergoing what I would call a silver tsunami of aging. And I'll count myself amongst, amongst those folks. 
Um, and that means that our families are aging with us. So touching upon things about how you may look at your estate and helping other family members and what we're allowed to gift to somebody, concepts of how to plan for that, um, needs for special needs trusts, or even how much one can effectively offer towards someone else's life under current tax laws. This is such a composite of a lifelong plan that I think it's remarkable that an organization like yours was developed was developed amongst parents and continues to thrive today. And, and it clearly is an example for all of us about how we may live our lives from the day we have a child or a sibling, any relative with a disability through the end of our lives and as theirs continue. I just wanted to mention that while we, we, we talked earlier about um, how as a society we're trying to become more inclusive and trying to make sure that kids are educated uh, and involved as much as possible with their typically developing peers. Another emphasis that we've been trying to um, focus on now is on self-advocacy and in teaching the child themselves to speak up and tell their teachers and tell other people they work with what they need. Um, and we found it's much more powerful sometimes for the student to come to their IEP meeting and say, this is what I need, this is what helps me. This is what gets in the way of my learning. Um, and it's often much more effective if they can say it than if the parents say it. Um, and as they get older and they're going to have to deal with situations where their parent may not always be there, or um, if they're legally an adult and the doctor, the uh, college professor or whomever doesn't want to speak to the parent, the child or the student, young adult, has to learn to speak up for themselves. And this is hard for many, many kids that are growing up, and it's specific, particularly hard sometimes for kids with special needs, um, especially when kids don't want to acknowledge that there may be something different or that they may have needs that other people don't have. But this has become a very uh, important focus for us is to uh, counsel parents and work with parents on developing these skills in their kids. And in fact, we're having a training um, later in this year, in June, I believe, on having students lead their own IEP meetings. And one of our parent advisors, who used to be a special ed teacher uh, before he retired, helped students figure out how to run their own meetings. And uh, so it's an interesting concept that's being promoted a bit now. And we'd really love to have more kids uh, being able to do that. What things have you seen in the last few years that give you hope that this continues to grow towards that participation? What has changed in Marin that you feel particularly good about in, say, the last 10 years? Well, I think there just has been more, um, more acceptance of the idea that students should be with their peers. They shouldn't, you know, in some cases they need a special school or a special classroom, but uh, really focusing on how we can involve kids in their school classes with other kids that are typically developing and not just in school, but recreational activities, uh, all sorts of things, sports, other activities, wherever they can be included, they should be included. And I think there's become more and more um, acceptance of that. In terms of healthcare needs for folks 
that are navigating new systems, um, what kind of advice can you give them in terms of even finding out what what their health plans will cover in terms of any special needs? How do how do folks learn to navigate through these these you know myriads of systems? Um. Well, we refer people sometimes to the health commissioner. Um, there is a department, you know, a state department that's uh, of insurance that's supposed to help people navigate. We know some about uh, insurance programs. Of course, every insurance company has slightly different uh, provisions, but there are things that are required by state law that we can, you know, let parents know. For example. Uh, children on the autism spectrum are supposed to get uh, what's called ABA therapy, behavior therapy, uh, and that's supposed to be covered by insurance, so we can let people know that. And, um, you know, really, it, like every other system, it's, it, it becomes sometimes frustrating and requires persistence, but you have to deal with whoever is running the program. So whatever health insurance program you have, you have to talk to your representative and um, find out from them, you know, exactly what's covered and, and not take no for an answer. <laughs> it just it requires persistence. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's not rocket science, but it does take organizational skills and it takes a bit of figuring out how to um, put together evidence um, you know, where's your report from the doctor? Where's your report from the therapist? Um, what does the information in those reports actually say? Uh, how do you get that across to the people who are making decisions? So it, as I said, it's not rocket science. It just requires organization and persistence. Any other thoughts, Barbara? <laughs> Well, you don't really, I was just thinking that it really is quite, quite like developing a case uh, for something so that you have your facts lined up, you have, you know, everything you need, and then what you don't need, then you know where to get, and then you put it all together, and then you present it like you would to a judge in a court with, a, certainly it's that way with the uh, medical uh, insurances you know it's very kind of court-like with them um <clears throat> but uh it's all it's all very doable and the, the and the key is don't take no for an answer so joan kilburn who was really the the true founder of matrix um she was a person that nobody could say no to i mean they could say it but it didn't matter because she never stopped. It didn't deter her from asking for what she wanted. And so don't take no for an answer. Just build your case and present it and don't get mad. And present your case and then keep presenting it. And eventually, if you don't wear people down or they want to just <laughs> get rid of you and say, OK, we'll grant that service for you and only you, um, you know, they'll, they'll come around to your way of thinking. So it's important. We should add that to the matrix literature or a sign that says, don't take no for an answer. Yeah. yeah. And the other thing I always counsel parents is they, they often say, well, what, what services does the school have to provide? And I said, well, you know, there are certain things that are required, but don't hesitate to ask for more because you might just get it, especially if you ask nicely and persistently. <laughs> and, and sometimes <laughs> I've seen that happen uh, where, where the school personnel, because the parent was effective and persistent in a pleasant way, they said, oh, yeah, we can go the extra mile for you. And uh, so it's always worthwhile asking. Um, I was wondering, have you, I guess, maybe you may or not know this, has there been like more acceptance of IEPs, at least in the system? I know with certain changes, there's things where I didn't necessarily qualify for one, but then 
years later I had testing that could have. So I was just wondering if you've noticed. Well, this is a this is an area where um, we work with parents a lot in terms of getting the appropriate assessments done. And um, parents may or may not be aware that if the school system does an assessment and they don't agree with the results, they have the right to ask for an independent assessment at public expense. Um, it's not always granted, but most of the time it is where, you know, if the, they don't feel like the school did a good job, they can ask for a private uh, therapist to do the assessment. And that it gives additional information that can go into the decision making. Oh, okay, good to know, thank you. It sounds like that's been an evolutionary process unto itself. Um, the idea that you could ask for literally a second opinion on this, another evaluation. How long down the road did that come? You know, that's, I don't know the answer to that. I've been at Matrix for about 10 years and that's always been the case. In fact, I would say the it's a little bit the opposite. It used to be that schools pretty automatically would pay for an uh, alternative evaluation. The rule is that they either have to pay for it or they have to file for due process with the Office of Administrative Hearings to defend their own assessment. And more recently than in, in previous years, schools have been willing to, to go before a hearing officer and say, we think we did a good job. We think our therapist was, our school psychologist was eminently qualified and they did all the right kind of testing and they interpreted the results appropriately. And so if they're willing to do that, then, then they can get out of paying for the private assessment. A parent can always have an assessment done. It's a question of whether the school system has to pay for it. And they're pretty expensive. So um, many, many parents could not afford to have one done. And so it's, it's important that when it's a good idea that they, they ask and try to get the, the independent assessment done through public funding. May I draw attention um, to one of your archive trainings that some of our listeners may find of value? Um, and it's quite an extensive list, but you posted back in 2018, Assessments, the Key to Special Education. I think this um, is something that folks who are particularly interested in this, the IEP basics, um, you have a remarkable resource here um, that has been archived, and it is, it is many of these are bilingual. Um, there are some remarkable things for people to start with, and we are very, very grateful to have had you here tonight to talk about some of these things. And we hope you won't be strangers. Um, we would very much appreciate you keeping the law library um, informed about upcoming trainings and sharing from your Facebook page um, any links of continued training. We'd love to see them. Okay, we'll be happy to do that. Um, any other thoughts or questions for these two wonderful people tonight? We are very grateful. We look forward to beginning a relationship with you and being able to offer you as a resource to anyone that might come to us with questions. Um, I am very, very grateful that you and Barbara came to us tonight. And again, don't be strangers. And in the future, if it's possible, I would like to see us collaborate on some work together. That would be great. Thank you so much, Barbara Alexander and Margaret Johnston. We are delighted to have had you. And again, let's make this the beginning of a nice relationship. Thank you so much tonight. May I remind folks that we will be having another presentation next month. We will be having um, the folks from the Marin County Department of Probation um, come and visit with us. 
You will be able to see tonight's recording of this event on both our website and on YouTube, and we will also make this available to the wonderful folks at Matrix. Thank you so much. Have a good and safe evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.